mic here. Well, let's let's get started. Okay, if you don't mind. All right, so so welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for for being here this evening uh, for this conversation with Dr. Gregory Bataro. Um, so I'll introduce our our guest in in just a minute. Um, but first of all, my name is Patrick Manning. Uh, I'm an assistant. Uh, associate, I got promoted recently, Associate Professor of Pastoral uh. Theology <laughs> Thanks. Uh, over in the Seminary School of Theology. Uh, so this is uh, our, our kickoff event for our second annual Contemplative Community Week. Uh, so this is uh, a, a week long of events, of presentations, uh, meditation, prayer, contemplative practices, Uh, And the whole idea is to invite members of our Seton Hall community uh, into uh, a more holistic well-being, into a a deeper kind of of learning, uh, into uh, more of a a personal and a a communal connectedness. Uh, So this is a whole week of events uh, that that we have going on. Um, So we're grateful uh, to our co-sponsors for helping us to to make this happen this evening. to, for the, uh, the Center for Faculty Development, Counseling and Psychological Services, uh, the Great Minds Dare to Care campaign, Campus Ministry, the Center for Catholic Studies, and Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology. Um, so with that, let me introduce our, our guest for this evening, Dr. Bataro. Uh, so Dr. Bataro is a clinical psychologist and the founder of the Catholic Psych Institute uh, in New York City. He received his doctorate in clinical psychology from the Institute for the Psychological Sciences in Arlington, Virginia, uh, which integrates Catholic theology with the best of modern psychological practice. Uh, Dr. Bataro's book, The Mindful Catholic, which we have for sale outside, uh, is a really fascinating book uh, that built on um, his his years of teaching a course on mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, integrating that with, with Catholic spirituality. So, uh, so prior to his career in psychology, Dr. Bataro uh, spent some time discerning a religious vocation with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal uh, and serving the poor in the Bronx in the tradition of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, his, his work has attracted a lot of attention and he's a, a sought after speaker uh, all around the country, so we're really uh, fortunate to have him here. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Bataro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the, the format for the evening is uh, we're, we're going to have a bit of a conversation and, and try and draw out um, some of Dr. Bataro's thinking on these themes of uh, mindfulness, mental health, and spirituality. Uh, but before we, we dive into all of that, you know, I, I gave the, the obligatory bio, but maybe you can personalize it a little bit for us and tell us, you know, especially, I mean, how did, how did you find your, in, your, your way into this, this work of, of psychology? I mean, what, what led you here? Sure, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to share. Um, my, my heart was just always directed in this, in this way uh, since my conversion in, in the year 2000. Um, when I was a freshman, I was at Boston College, and I remember I was taking some philosophy with Peter Kreeft, and, uh, and somebody had given me a book by John Paul II called Love and Responsibility, and it just lit my heart on fire. And I knew that, first of all, I had to like really understand my faith uh, to make something meaningful with my life, and I wanted to help people understand that same truth. And I had suffered some pain in my own life from my parents' divorce, so love and responsibility was really interesting as like an antidote to the lies of, let's call it relativism, um, where, where people just kind of do whatever they think is right and, and whatever they feel good about uh, without any kind of objective standard. And so, you know, I read this book and it was like this manual and I was like, if I could just, you know, use this, it could heal marriages, it could heal families, and this must be like a manual of psychology. But it wasn't a manual of psychology. It's like some really difficult to read philosophy. And, and you know, many people have not actually read through it. So, I, but that was what oriented me that way to understand, like, I want to help people. I think I want to bring the faith into psychology. Um, and then when I was in college, I, I also discovered St. Francis. And, and I started discerning religious life. And so I was really confused. 
I wasn't sure exactly what to do. I think it's like sort of the, the narrative of every college student, you know, just trying to figure that out. And, and um, as, I, as I, you know, long story short, I spent three and a half years with the Franciscan Friars. I actually lived for a year down the street at uh, Most Blessed Sacrament is where their novitiate is. And um, it was during that time, and then a year or two afterwards, working with Father Benedict Rochelle, another Catholic psychologist priest, who, who helped me understand how to pray, how to really listen to the voice of God. And then I understood more than faith helping me feel good or finding an answer to life's questions, it was a relationship with God who had a plan for my life. And so then that was the, the final step for me there in, in that discernment was like, how do I actually listen to the voice of God who speaks in silence? And ultimately ended up becoming the, the seeds for what led into mindfulness and prayer of abandonment and trustful surrender. But that was where my life took me at that point. And then I, I realized I wanted to leave. Uh, I actually had a vocation to, to marriage. And so I left, uh, went back to graduate school, got my degree. And then I uh, met my, li- my wife in my last year of, of my doctoral program in 2012, married her, moved to New York City, opened a practice, and um, that was over um, 10 years ago now, almost 10 years ago. Uh, so we've, uh, we've had now six kids in 10 years and uh, opened up a bunch of offices and have an awesome practice with a lot of really awesome people I get to work with. Uh, so you've been busy, but it sounds like your She's wife's been, been even busy. busier. <laughs> She's <is> very busy. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you gave us a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a hint here. You said you know, certainly what you're doing now came out of uh, you know, your, your own experience. And you know, obviously, you know, we, all of us have some need for healing in our lives. But you know, we, we're living through this very difficult time right now. I mean, there, we were seeing a, a mental health uh, crisis even before the pandemic, uh, which obviously has just exacerbated things. Yeah. So, I mean, so what, what have you been seeing in, in your practice? I mean, in, you know, in, in, in these 10 years, in the past few years, especially, I mean, like, where, you know, where is this, where is this all coming from? I mean, why is it, is it just, does it just seem worse than it did before? Or do you think that things really are getting more difficult? Well, I think, I think, um, I think both. I think it's. I think the surface level is getting hotter. But I think it's a, a manifestation of the deeper problems that have been there for a while, uh, at least as long as I've been around. Um, you know, I think. I think ultimately we have a, an absence of God in our culture, and it leaves people needing something to to ground themselves on. And without a higher power, without God as a Father who loves us and directs our steps. We're left to our own devices to figure out how to make sense of everything. And if everything's relatively at peace and everything's fine and there's no coronavirus in the world or whatever, it's like, okay, maybe you can muster up the answer to make sense of today. But then when the actual external circumstances get difficult and you realize you're up against this wall that you don't have an answer to, then, it, then it, everything unravels. So the surface level is bringing into light the need for the absence of God and the need for God as, as a, a, an answer, as a source of, of direction. Are there, you know, so obviously we have, um, I mean, this huge thing going on with, with the pandemic. Uh, are, there, are there more uh, particular, even, you know, smaller kind of, you know, stressors or triggers that are, you know, are the things that sort of, you know, that send people, you know, to your office? Are there kind of, you, know, t- you know, push people over the tipping point? Well, I think, I think the way that culture has dealt with hitting that wall is to try to dig in to, well, my way must be the right way. And it's created these divides politically, socially, that, uh, you know, and, and coronavirus and the pandemic, I think, really brought this out to the surface where, you know, if you look at things like wearing a mask or getting a vaccine or all these things that people argue about, And it doesn't matter which side of the argument you're on. People are are separating from each other and and cementing into their own perspective. So isolation is, I think, the deepest problem. It's the deepest wound. And if we understand God to be a trinity and community and we're made in his image for for communio, for communion with, with each other, with relationship, then 
isolation is, is the anti-God. It's the opposite of God. It's, it's actually what the enemy wants for us is to be separated from each other. So, you know, people, people t- try to like, you know, get me into like, what's your opinion on, you know, vaccines? And, ma- and first of all, like, I'm not a physician. I don't have an opinion on a vaccine, like medically. But my opinion on it psychologically is everybody needs to calm down on the way that they're arguing about it. Because I don't care if you're right or wrong, if the mask is right or wrong, if the vaccine, if triple X booster shot times 12 is the answer or not. The way that we're engaging in this conversation is completely wrong. And, and no matter what the right physical answer is or medical answer is, the psychological wound is deepening. And so this is what I see happening now with the news media, with political opinions, with people's own social opinions and neighborhoods and communities. I think that's the real problem. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in, in this point about, you know, you say, I mean, you, you've actually, you've made this theological move in, in your response and in, in saying that, I mean, really at the heart of this is, you know, who our constitution, our nature, who we're created to be, and actually so often sort of living at odds with, with that. So, I mean, could you take us a little, a little bit deeper into that? I mean, what do you see in terms of, like, what, you know, what is it about the human being um, that, you know, we, so much of your work is, uh, and, and we'll really get into it in a minute, but uh, recognizing the human need for, you know, a desire for integration, you know, balance to kind of, you know, slow down in different ways to pay closer attention to things. I mean, what, what is it about us that these are the kind of things that are good for us, but, you know, the, the isolation, the busyness, uh, the, you know, too much time on, on screens that the, you know, that these are things that we're not, we're not happy, we're not healthy when this is how we're living our lives. So, I mean, what, what is it about us? Yeah, there, there's a lot there. Um, I, you know, I think that we, God made us to be able to receive the beauty of his, his fingerprint, his thumbprint in everything. And, and, and we, be, we, we are able to see him, his presence and, and the mark of his, his truth and goodness and beauty in the world around us, most especially in other people. But even, even just in nature or math or, or really anything that, that is of, of the natural order. But we're so distracted, for, especially from technology, but even just from our own narratives, our own busyness, our own lies that we're trying to, again, build up that wall, build up against that wall that we've hit, that somehow I have to have all the answers. And you can even look at technology distraction as a, a, a defense mechanism because I can't find the answer. So then, I'm, oh, I'm, I have to find something else to do that's more important. Or this driving narrative of I have to perform or I have to succeed or I have to do more. And, and whatever those narratives are, they're all distractions against this ultimate reality that I'm not the creator of the universe. But we're built to perceive the creator of the universe if we could be at peace with his reality of his being. So if, if we could learn how to, to slow down, this is the problem. It's not so simple. See, a lot of times these like, you know, being contemplative, being, you know, developing a, a, a pattern of meditation, it sounds foofy. It sounds Starbucksy and Lululemon and I'm going to do my, you know, get my exercise in and, you know, and it's like, it's hard because we have to confront all the stuff that we're running away from inside of ourselves. And if we don't prepare people for that, and then they actually confront it, they want nothing to do with it. Or their psyche wants nothing to do with it, and they're going to find a million reasons to not do it anymore. But if we can understand that, number one, this is what we're made for. Number two, this is the reason why we're miserable. Number three, there are experts, mentors, guides who have gone before us that can actually get us through the gauntlet. And, and then number four, that God himself is actually giving us the grace to persevere. What's on the other side is a reward that's indescribable. But I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't see that necessarily coming through like the Headspace app, you know, or a lot of these things. I think they're great and it's a good introduction, but we have to, we have to take it to that next level. 
Do you, do you find that this is uh, that this is a, a hard sell because you know because there there are different ways of interpreting uh, the kind of experiences that you know that you're talking about you know you, you know so we you know we all want to uh, you know we all want a life that's meaningful we all kind of want to have it figured out we like to be in control of things and you know when when we're unable to do that you know you would argue it's because you know I'm I'm not the creator I don't have the the power to do all that. But obviously, as you've alluded to, there are a lot of different narratives out there about, you know, I mean, we, you know, practically every time you look at a, an advertisement or, you know, look at a new post on, on social media, there's, I mean, there's a different account underlying that of, you know, who we are and how we're supposed to live our life. So, I mean, when you work with people, do you find that this is, that this is something that people are able to, to recognize in themselves relatively easily? Or is, you know, is this a hard, is it a hard sell here? I, I think it's a hard sell. And, and I think that people, I think with the right relationships, it can be easier. But the problem is that we all are in the same boat. And so, like, I can stand here saying, like, I believe that I'm creating probably some of the best social media content out there because what I'm proposing, I believe, is based on this model of truth, goodness, and beauty. But I will also tell you that I'm also suffering from the same narratives that are keeping me distracted from the silence in my own heart. So if I'm the one that actually knows this enough to be creating the content that's out there for other people, but I'm struggling with this, then how in the world is this something that we can expect everybody else to just have to figure out on their own? So it, it has to be this relational thing. And we need leaders, we need guides, we need people in our life that are willing to say, you know what, this is really hard for me too. Because I've, I work with bishops, I work with priests, I work with religious, I work with CEOs of companies, and I work with everyone else in between. Everybody's actually avoiding silence. That's actually the truth. And I am avoiding silence. And so, at the end of the day, we all have reasons that when we, if we actually allow ourselves to be quiet and go into silence, we're going to confront some, some difficult things inside of us. And we, and we need help. We need, we need courage and we need help to know how to do that well. All right, so Dr. Bataro, so what, what kind of help can you give us here? <laughs> so um, so you've, you've written this book called The Mindful Catholic. Uh, and here you're, you, you define mindfulness uh, in, in a fairly standard way as a you know, non-judgmental attention to, to the present moment. Um, but you know you're you're doing something uh, in, interesting here, and maybe a little bit of controversial, and you know, in bringing mindfulness and in a Catholic spirituality together. Um, so is you know before we get even more sort of in, you know into the weeds here, um, I mean, why why would a, a Christian practice mindfulness? I mean, if you know if, if the problem here is that I'm sort of denying my creatureliness and I'm denying my Creator. Uh, I mean, why why isn't it enough to you know to why don't I just get better at prayer? What you know, what does mindfulness have to do with all of this? Yeah, it's a great question, and it really comes down to um, defining what things are. You know, if we're going to have an argument about something for or against it, like we really should know like what our terms mean, and and what we're saying is the argument here. And I take it very seriously. I mean, I'm I'm uh, you know a, a fully devout card-carrying, magisterial Catholic, like 100% follow the teachings of the church and believe every bit of it. Um, so I take it very seriously if somebody says, you know, is this thing that you're doing, well, mindfulness is Buddhist, so this is, you know, syncretism, and this is going to lead people astray and all these things. It's like, all right, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's the last thing I'm here to do. So let's break this down and really understand what we're talking about. And what I find to be there's, there's a number of problems that are inherent in our culture now. Number one is, is uh, this idea of Cartesian dualism, which is a, a, a misunderstanding of our identity as our spirits being separate from our bodies. And the truth is that we have this integration of our humanity. So this is a whole other topic that could go off in a whole other conference, let alone talk. But our psychological life has to be looked at in terms of our biological reality. And the psychology of our experience overlaps, certainly, with our spiritual life. But 
has a, a major component coming from the brain and from our hormonal system of our body. So if we're going to talk about things psychological, we have to admit to a certain scientific observable reality of how the body enters into that conversation. And then if we're going to also make arguments against something on a spiritual basis, we really should be defining our terms. So just calling something Buddhism or mindfulness or even non-Catholic, like that really doesn't say anything. So we really want to break these things down to their points. So long story short, and I do have an addendum in the book where I cover this, and I have some YouTube videos and things out there where I talk about this, but there is a very important distinction to make between Buddhist mindfulness and Catholic mindfulness. And it's a worldview difference. It's not a biology difference because we're the same humans. Buddhists and Catholics are actually made with the same biology. That might be shocking to some people, but <laughs> we actually all have the same DNA, we have the same brains, and we have the same neurological systems. So when we're talking about the physiological process of mindfulness, we're looking at the same brain. Now, the justification to why a Buddhist might practice this physiological exercise may be very different from the justification for why a Catholic may practice this physiological exercise even if, at the end of the day, both are doing something that's physiologically healthy. And when we look at the physiological exercise, mindfulness is itself a physiological exercise. Paying attention has to do with the cognitive faculty of the brain to the present moment, has to do with a definition of time and space, non-judgmentally. It's another cognitive faculty. That's where the imagination enters in with our intelligence. We're, we're only in the realm of physiology and time and space and material scientific order here. Now, a Buddhist would say that uh, the multiplicity of being, the diversity of being is an illusion. And through this practice, we can have an experience of entering into the unity of all being, which is worldview, I'm putting this over here in a, in a bracket, truth as opposed to the lie, the illusion of the multiplicity of being over here. So you and I being separate people, that's an illusion. Me being separate from this chair is an illusion. And if I practice this physiological practice, it's moving me on this way towards enlightenment, which is where I understand this truth. Now, I would adamantly disagree with that worldview. And in fact, we could get into some very interesting understanding here, which is which I love to have this discussion philosophically with, with people who have a Buddhist mindset because the unity that they have a finger on is actually true. We believe in the unity of being as well because we believe that God is one. But we also believe in the mystery of the Trinity. See, God is not just a Trinity. God is one and three. So there is a oneness of God that is manifest in all of the created nature of the order, which reflects his oneness. So it's really fascinating. The Buddhists are not seeing something wrong. They're just not seeing the full picture because they don't hold the mystery of there being the one and the three. So the diversity of being, we believe, from a Christian anthropology, is just as true as the oneness of being. Because the threeness of God, the source of all being, is just as true as the oneness of God. So if we as Christians can hold both, then that's where we can hold, straddle the line and sort of hold both perception, interpretations of, of the reality that we're experiencing. So all of this to say, we're still practicing physiologically a very healthy thing, but we can have a totally different worldview of why we're doing it. Ultimately, what I do in this book is map the connection between a traditional Catholic spirituality called abandonment to divine providence with what's happening physiologically in the brain in this newly discovered contemporary understanding of mindfulness-based stress reduction. And as you're learning how to do the cognitive manual how-to step-by-step process of mindfulness-based stress reduction, if you're practicing it as a Christian, 
you can tie it to what this whole spirituality of abandonment to divine providence is really all about. And I think that that can be really effective for people that want more than just the spiritual reading. They want to tie the spiritual to their human experience and be able to go very deep with it. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, so go ahead. So why don't you take us a little bit deeper? Into, because, um, so you, you know, someone I take has been influential for you would be, you know, de Kassad, the, you know, sacrament of, of the present moment, abandonment to self, uh, or self-abandonment to divine providence. He actually says, that, you know, in this book that it's, I mean, that spirituality is actually really simple. It's, it's just, you know, we don't need all this complexity. It's just you abandon yourself to God's will in every single moment. And yet you've just said that, well, it, but it can actually be helpful uh, to approach it through, you know, through this kind of mindfulness approach. So, I mean, can you tease this out a little bit more for I mean, what is, what is that adding for us? Yeah, so it is, it's, it is that simple. But we mess it up. We complicate it. So we need the manual because we've gotten ourselves into these, like, worlds of complication. And... and so I, the course that I teach is eight weeks, and then I have another version of it I call the virtual retreat, which is uh, f- like five-minute daily videos for 56 days. So you're doing it over eight weeks, but you're getting just a daily five-minute video. Because even a, a weekly 90-minute lecture is too much for people to focus and pay attention to because we've complicated our... College students probably are in a different place. It's easier to handle a 90-minute lecture, but it's still pretty challenging. So people out in the real world... You know, it's like, forget about it. You give them five minutes, maybe they'll pay attention to a five-minute video. And we've done that to ourselves because of filling our minds with distractions. And we get so distracted that we're going to go here, go here, go here. I was just watching uh, the, the, um, the, you know, the Pixar movie Up. They have these spinoffs now on Disney Plus with the dog. So it's Doug is the dog. So it's like Life of Doug or something like that. So I'm watching with my little kids. And they have their little shorts. So he's always he's going, squirrel! You know, he like goes off, he loses his, his focus. Squirrel! And like that's our brain. We're constantly looking at squirrels. So <laughs> if, we have, if we have this little process, and what I tell people is like through the eight weeks, you're going to have a moment. And it might come in the first week, and for some people it comes in the eighth week. But you have a moment. And sometimes people have to repeat the eight weeks a second time. But it, I promise, if you do it every day, you will have that moment. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, this is so simple. That's what it means. And it's just like the whole thing becomes clear. And it's so simple. But getting somebody to that insight is so hard. And, it, and it, that's where we have to do the work because we're so used to living with the thoughts that are in our mind that they, they just have, live rent-free, like this is just what they do all day, you know, every day. And then we're trying to, like, push in this, like, sliver of this new idea. And then ev- you just keep pushing, and eventually it gets in there. And then it makes sense. But it is super simple. And then when you have that reality, it's like, it actually, now all of it makes sense. We can have peace. It makes sense that we can have peace. When Jesus says, do not be anxious about the things of your life, you're like, oh yeah, that's possible. You know, we, we, as Christians, we look at this stuff and we're like, okay, he told us that he's going to turn his flesh into bread. Like, okay, I can hang in there with that. But then it's like, do not be anxious about the things of your life. <laughs> like, ah, he can't be serious about that one. <laughs> you know, but actually, that's possible when we realize what this means. He's the father and he's the creator and he loves us and he's with us. So he's all knowing, he's all powerful and he's all loving. We literally have nothing to worry about. So if that's what's true and all I have to do is connect with that truth in this moment right now, that's the answer. But it takes a lot to get there. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think your comments are, um, they're drawing, I mean, to go back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, the problem with this mind-body dualism, and, you know, I mean, there, there really is something insightful in, in a Christian anthropology, Catholic anthropology, recognizing that, you know, that unity of body and soul, and, I mean, if this is true, then it helps us to understand this, this experience that, that you're talking about, that, 
it's not enough to just kind of have the thought or, you know, for someone to, for even Jesus to, you know, to say, don't be anxious. You don't have to be anxious. Uh, we need, you know, if we've been so trained and conditioned to think the opposite, to feel the opposite, then we really need to be trained back into this. Um, so you, um, so to get a little more specific on this point, you know, you, you talk in your book about uh, habit disruptors. So, you know, so what are, what are some of these habits that, that need to be disrupted that, that uh, you know, a, a mindfulness, even a Catholic mindfulness can, can help a, someone to disrupt? Yeah, I mean, even that, even as an exercise, they're just like random, like all these exercises are just, I'm just taking shots at people's psyche, like from every direction. Like, let me help you have a different experience. Because it's our common experience that gets us into the rut. You know, neurologically, we talk about plasticity, neuroplasticity. And it's like, the more that we use a certain neural pathway, the more we do a certain pattern of behaviors, thinking and feeling and acting, it, it, it just like digs in the rut, you know, and just like tires on a dirt track. And if we can just get that wheel out of that rut, we can just maybe dig that one in a little less and dig in a new one a little bit more. And so we create these new new neural pathways and it's it we, the things we've learned about plasticity what can be changed in the brain over time is just absolutely fascinating what we you know if, if you learn neuro, neurology in like the 80s it would it, there was these like developmental phases and it's like once you've cemented in your brain a certain way like that's it and then all of a sudden we discovered that there's all these new ways that things can change and and, and the brain can be restructured and, and, and different parts can do different things and it's really amazing. So I'm just taking different shots at people to try to get them to, do, to get that tire out of that rut. So when I call a, something a habit disruptor, it's like, okay, you go to dinner every night and you sit at your table a certain seat in a certain seat, change the seats. So just one night you just call it like, new, you know, habit disruptor night, you call it whatever you night, musical chairs night, whatever. And it's like, just everybody move one seat to the left. And you just eat dinner from a different seat at the table. And you just notice, like, what looks different? What sounds different? What tastes different? You know, what's different? And then, you know, one day it's like, how about everybody, let's sit on the floor and eat dinner tonight. What, what, what would that be like? Like, what if you just sat around the table on the floor and had dinner? That's weird. Like, <laughs> maybe that's, maybe don't ever do that again. Maybe you realize that's a big mistake. So, so what does this accomplish other than making people uncomfortable? Because uh, I, know, I know my students like it when I tell them to, because I'll do this sort of thing. I'll, you know, I'll move them around into, into different seats. Or I was, I was just talking with someone last night who he likes to play the trick on Catholic specifically where he will, he'll let everyone filter into the room while he's sitting up front, and then he'll move to the desk he has set up in the back of the back of the room, and now that's the front. Uh, so people like their, you know, they like their spaces. So what does this accomplish other than just making a person temporarily uncomfortable? Yeah, so that's it. If you, I mean, when you take that wheel out of the rut, it's uncomfortable. You know, you hit the bump, and now you're riding on a road that's yeah. not traveled before, and it's uncomfortable. But what it does is it makes you be aware of assumptions you were making before that you, you didn't even realize you were making. And so, I, like I said, are you gonna keep doing the new thing as if it's the better thing? No, definitely not. Maybe there's a reason you're doing it the other way, but it's gonna cause you to see different questions to ask. You know, another one that I put in there, and this was before COVID, but it was like, go to the movie theater and just, you know, don't pick the movie before you get to the theater. Just go to the movie theater, and then when you get there, randomly pick a movie. And, you know, that throws off all sorts. I get emails to this day, so many people like, oh, you know, you're leading me to sin and now I'm going to watch some movie and I didn't know this. And I'm like, it's uncomfortable. And, you know, you could have picked the animated movie when you got there. Like, I didn't tell you which movie to watch, but it's like, you know, but, but something was uncomfortable and they have to find a reason to, be, to justify why I feel bad about this. But really what's going on is like you want to be in control. Like you want to know that you're going to see a certain movie at a certain time and you can get your certain box of Sour Patch Kids and you know you, know you can get your certain popcorn. And so we could change that up. We disrupt it and then, and then we learn that we don't have to go through life every day with the same patterns. So and, you know, presumably uh, disrupting these habits is you know, not just 
purely for the sake of throwing our, li- our lives into chaos, but, you know, I mean, maybe to open us up to the possibility of, you know, of, of better habits, uh, you know, of somehow this is going to open the door to some kind of, you know, personal growth, you know, better, you know, more well-being, uh, you know, stronger spirituality. I mean, where does this lead? So there, there's a deeper, there's a deeper sort of like peda- uh, pedagogy here that's, that has to do with like, well, you know, the narratives that we have ha- habits of carrying inside of ourselves and the patterns of thinking that we carry within ourselves. And another example of this, the worst kind of habit disruptor, or I, I should say they're, they're good and bad, but major life changes. When somebody dies that's really close to us, it's a habit disruptor. Or if we have a terminal diagnosis for ourselves, or when life comes into the world, you know, when I had my first baby, you know, and it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> what am I doing? I know nothing, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're just like, I saw the world so wrong yesterday, and now I see it differently. And I didn't realize the patterns and narratives that I was holding yesterday when I was holding them, but now that this new thing happened, it disrupted my patterns and I see everything differently, including the clarity with which I can see the way I saw yesterday. And what happens in, in mental health is, especially with depression, with anxiety, with all these patterns of, of really putting ourselves down, um, of needing to be in control and not even realizing that we're carrying this illusion that we're in control of our lives, it, it just bears tremendous burden on, on our, our social-emotional health. And so... When people have anxiety, you know, the narrative, it's like the house has to be cleaned a certain way. The room has to look a certain way. I have this certain, um, you know, routine that I have to do every night before I go to bed. It's like, really? You know, if, if the world was ending tomorrow, if, if somebody was dying tomorrow, if you were bringing a baby into the world tomorrow, do you really think that that thought would be there as strong as it is right now? I bet that would change. If it could change, then maybe should it change? You know, and if, if it's causing you these deeper layers of pain and suffering, maybe that's not a burden that you're called to bear. And if we can figure out how to unearth those patterns and disrupt them and change them and get you to think about them with more clarity, then maybe that's actually the kind of peace that God is calling us to. Um, so, you know, so for me, this brings up an interesting point that... Um, you're using this definition of mindfulness as a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment, and yet it sounds like what you're talking about there, as we would expect, you know, of a Catholic, is you're making some judgments about, well, you know, this, you know, this state of being is better than than another, or even, you know, in talk earlier talking about, well, you would you would argue that a uh, that a, a, a Christian uh, understanding of reality is actually, you know, truer than, you know, than a Buddhist. So, so, I mean, sort this out for us. I mean, you, you want us to practice mindfulness, which is not judgmental, but you're making judgments about these things. So how do we hold these together? Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, I think, you know, I, I, do, I do think that there are going to be ways that other worldviews fall short and that ultimately we believe that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Like, this is the fullness of reality. So the Christian way of looking at this is going to have all the answers. And not saying that all Christians are good at manifesting all the answers and doing it the right way, but we do believe in that worldview as the right worldview. World and, and this is the question where if you go deeper into some of the more Buddhist practice, you do hit some walls here. And that question is one of them that I've, you know, I've, I've seen that happen, where it's like, how are you judging this non-judgmental practice of, of this particular present moment? And, and the way that I look at that is, say, from a Christian anthropology, is that because we, because, and it does come back to this connection to the diversity and the unity of being. Philosophically, metaphysically, there's something that's happening there because in, as we are aware of the present moment, we're, we're holding two spaces at the same time. And this can be seen psychologically, and this can be understood spiritually. But we're on, on one level, we're in the present moment. But on the other level, we're, we're sort of transcending what's happening in that present moment. 
So I, in the book, I call it the transcendent and the proximate quality of awareness. And, and this is true of anything. Like if somebody goes to mindfulness classes, there's probably a reason. Another, another um, seeming sort of paradox is that it's supposed to be goalless, like without a goal. Your mindfulness practice is supposed to be without a goal. That's impossible. Why am I going to this class? Why am I practicing this exercise? So we, we can look at it, we can look at it and understand that we can be physiologically plugged into the present moment. Spiritually, we have these cognitive things that go beyond our brain even. Our awareness is ultimately grounded in a spiritual awareness which transcends what's happening through our bodies. And so we can have both. And, and so then we have approximate non-judgmental awareness because we've transcendentally chosen to judge living with unnecessary burdens as bad and following the way of Christ in a way of peace as good. So I'm sort of suspending my active cognitive function at that moment to enter into this practice. But it's, it's with context. It's grounded on something bigger than itself. It's not all that it is. It's, it's not all about mindfulness. It's just a tool. You know, it's like, oh, I know I want to get better at sort of creative thinking and outside, you know, maybe some mathematical creative thinking. I'm going to do Sudoku puzzles. I'm going to work on vocabulary. I'll practice crossword puzzles. I'm going to work on my, you know, uh, my ability to stay focused in the present moment. I'm going to work on mindfulness. Like there, those are exercises that we're choosing to do. Um, so I think, you know, kind of continuing with this thread. So earlier on, I was really, I'm coming at this from, from the angle of, okay, you know, what does is, what is mindfulness get us beyond, you know, sort of a, you know, a Christian practice of, of prayer, for example. But I mean, so what about this, the other side of this? Um, there is, mindfulness has become very, you know, very popular in, in the wider culture. There even, I've been talking to people, you know, now even, you know, Catholic schools are using mindfulness to help their students deal with, with their anxiety. Uh, and it seems, to be, it seems to work very well. You cite this in your book. There's now all this evidence of, of the benefits of mindfulness uh, for, you know, in all these different domains. So then why does anyone need prayer? Uh, what, you know, what is, what is does, the, does the Christian tradition offer something, and you've already been hinting at this, elites, but does the Christian tradition offer anything beyond what someone could gain simply by practicing mindfulness? Well, well yes, of course. So we have, we have you know, the, the mindfulness helps us to be the best functioning humans we can be, physiologically. But if we're the best physiologically functioning humans we can be, we're going to be brought right up against that wall. That ultimate question, what happens when I die? We're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're seeing the big picture, if we're thinking clearly about life, if we're observing other people die, in fact, everybody, as far as we understand, like this is the path I'm on, like if I'm going to actually be aware of what's happening clearly in the present moment, I also have awareness of the whole trajectory of humanity. I have to be able to answer that question. So no matter how, the better functioning, and this is why I was saying like, some of, this, some of this secular, foofy version of, of contemplative prayer, or, or, or not prayer, but meditation, or uh, you know, this, this pseudo-spirituality, or this, this like pop mindfulness, is, is, is uh, useless at best and dangerous at worst, because it brings us to the deepest realities that we have to have an answer to. And I'm not saying it's useless or dangerous because it can mislead us. It, it leads us to the most important questions. And then, depending on who's leading us, now we're vulnerable to what that particular teacher's take on how to answer that question. So if you're following a mindfulness, a Buddhist mindfulness guru who's taking you to that ultimate question, and then they're saying, ah, now you feel the oneness with being, and you're wondering, you know, is that, well, that is all that's real. And in fact, yourself is not real. And yourself is an illusion. And okay, now, now we're talking about some danger. That, that's very, 
dissociative for people. Like there are people who get all sorts of derealization and depersonalization and there's like psychological stuff that happens there when you start to really believe that you're not real. And, and so we have to be very careful about who's answering the question. It's, I, I pose it as what happens when you die. It's kind of like the most simple way to think about it. But it's like, what's out there? What else is happening here? And so we, we want to be able to understand, yes, we should want to be the healthiest humans we can be. But that's not going to give all the answer that we need because we also will see that there's something beyond this world. Um. So I'm going I'm to give our audience a, a heads up in a couple of minutes. I'll open it up for uh, any questions that you want to pose to Dr. Bataro. Um, so maybe, maybe one more for me, just following up on this. Um, so you're responding, I mean, you're, you're putting forward that there is, uh, there is a, an anthropology, you know, there is a worldview, there is a you know, meaning system uh, in Christianity that, um, you know, that is, you know, you, you would say it's, you know, it's true and it's advantageous in, in pursuing something else is, you know, potentially harmful. Um, is there, are there, yeah, again, I mentioned a lot of people, you know, even in Catholic context are, you know, are turning to mindfulness, meanwhile being really um, unaware of this rich contemplative tradition that there is within Christianity. Hmm. Um, are, I mean, would you say, are there, in addition to, to a kind of, you know, a, a worldview, um, are, there, are there particular practices, you know, as, I mean, would you, would you talk about, like, particular forms of prayer that you think, in, you know, in some ways offer something more than, you know, than what a, a, a mindfulness exercise might, might offer to us? Yeah, I, I think I think of mindfulness as the gateway drug for a good Catholic. I think <laughs> I think that uh, you know it just starts to you start to to, to sense that there's got to be more but when you when you feel all the beauty that's in this world, and it's it's a sort of like very Augustinian kind of approach, and it's it's very sort of um, existential, and it's like people are beautiful, and nature is beautiful, and like something's happening inside of me. Like I'm opening up to beauty that I didn't even know like I could feel. Like what's happening? And then you realize like maybe there's beauty that's bigger than me. Maybe, maybe I was made to feel this. And you know, you start to like be pulled in that direction. So it's kind of like, I think with a very distracted world, that's the, you know, inherit, that's inherited godlessness. It's, it's a really great gateway drug you know, to bring us into this experience. And then, and then we can go much deeper. So, I mean, I, I, I don't say that there's like a particular spirituality that's better than any other. I think that the saints are the authors of the spiritualities typically that we follow. And every saint is a, a beautiful manifestation of, of a human in love with God. And if somebody resonates more with a particular flavor of spirituality because of a personality or a cultural heritage or whatever it is, I say follow it, you know, if it takes you beyond yourself to trust in a God who actually loves you more than you ever thought possible. Yes, I mean, this, I don't think this was your precise point, but even, I mean, what you were just hinting at there, that there is a the fact that there are uh, all these different spiritualities in, and charisms with, within the Catholic tradition. And that's, you know, oh, yeah. may, maybe it's mindfulness that sort of sets someone down, down that path or, you know, often it's just uh, coming into contact with one of these people. But there are all these different ways of, uh, of going into spirituality, of seeking that meaning of, of, you know, learning more about ourselves and more about the divine that, that are available to us in that way. It's, it's really beautiful when you start to see it that way. And, and I, I do think that abandonment to divine providence is a great place to start, spiritually speaking. And then the more that I was looking for justification for a mindful way of thinking about things from the church, from saints of the church, uh, you, you start to realize every saint talks about this. I mean, every saint talks about the present moment and, and finding the presence of God, the eternal moment, the eternal awareness of, of uh, the awareness of God's eternal presence in these in individual moments. And so it really is this kind of like pervasive sense of how to communicate and how to relate to God. And then, and then, yeah, through different manifestations of different saints or different spiritual traditions within the church. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so we have, we have theologians and philosophers and all sorts of different people in, in this room. So um, at this time, I'll just invite anyone who would like to, um, please come on down and to the microphone and, and ask your questions. hundred percent. And even if it's not even about God, but it's really just about the world that we live in, families that we're coming from, you know, things like that. I mean, clinically, um, I, I practice from a, a, an interpersonal psychodynamic model. And so I'm always thinking about sort of what are your expectations of, you know, when I say God, we're talking about father, we're talking about parent, we're talking about authority, hierarchy, even me as a therapist, who am I to you? I'm the first representation of something that could actually hurt you very deeply. And so, you know, we're definitely not using that language clinically or psychologically. You know, sometimes we come around to that if it's appropriate, um, but we meet people where they're at. And so I would say that that's certainly the most important thing is to meet people where they're at, whether you're talking about students in the classroom or if you're working with, with clients or, or, or spiritual directees or students and, and, and advising them. It's really a matter of saying, like, what are, what are your expectations of the world? And uh, Martin Seligman has a great model, the PERMA model that he uses for, for um, resilience, building resilience. It, he, he studied it and found that it could be taught, which is the opposite of um, being vulnerable to trauma. So he studied soldiers that came back from wars and specifically ones who did not suffer PTSD. And he tried to find what are the underlying causes to what he called resilience to those who didn't end up with diagnosable PTSD. And he came up with these five categories to say they had high marks in these five. And, and uh, one of them was a sense of, of having um, meaning in the world, that there's some, some meaning beyond, beyond you that makes everything okay. So if you go out into the world knowing that it's not on your shoulders, it's not all on your shoulders, to make everything make sense, you're actually resilient and, and, have, and are much less likely to suffer trauma. So if you're thinking about like, what's the world view of the person coming into my classroom, office, whatever, where do they see the cracks in that, in that sort of picture? And, and maybe there's a conversation that can help them. Maybe there's a, a, a reprocessing of some event in their life that can help them. Maybe they can see differently that maybe it doesn't have to all be figured out by you and, and everything can still be okay. That was Martin, Martin Seligman. And there's a book describing some of his initial studies called Flourish. And that lays out the PERMA model, P-E-R-M-A. First of all, thank you for the wonderful excuse for me not to do housework and that my house is constantly a mess. Oh, I'm Lisa Rose Wiles, I'm in the library. Um, so one of the issues we have here, and it's rampant in academia, but I'm sure everywhere, is that the more you have to do, the more you're expected to do. Busyness is rewarded. Idleness is not. Same for students, especially for faculty. And you said you have dealt with all kinds of people, including CEOs. Have you ever any ideas, because we're really trying to do something about changing the culture, with putting cracks into that culture of, oh, do more with less. Oh, you're doing more with less. Do even more with even less. And it just is, is never ending. 
any advice about how to chip away at that? I, honestly, I still... Without getting fired. No, I... <laughs> I don't want you to get fired. I won't get fired. Maybe I won't get invited back, but we'll see. I, you know, I, I have to say that, honestly, I wrestle with this myself. And I really meant it when I say that I am dealing with my own distractions and my own running away from silence. And no matter what position we're in or who I'm working with, this is one of these like socially conscious questions that we need to think about how, what can we do for the system and the community. And I keep, like even for myself, I keep coming back to this. I just have to start with myself. And from there, I also realized, like, I can, I can work with an individual person. As long as our communities are still supporting and nurturing that false mindset, I, I don't know how else to crack the shell of that except for one person at a time. And because people don't believe it until they face their own suffering in their life that brings them to their knees and then with that one person, I can say, all right, now we can get to work. Because you've been believing this because your promotion schedule and your tra ten uh, tenure track and everything else, you're you know, is based on these ideas. But they just actually don't work. And so, yeah, I, don't, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. But I, I've, I can tell you that I've suffered the same frustration and, and I see the same problem. I just don't know if there's a better answer, a different way to go about it, besides realizing that it's got to be one person at a time. Tim Fortin from the School of Theology. Um, kind of a little two-part question, and you already addressed it in part. I was just, I unfortunately, I hope to remedy this, but I, I haven't read your book, so... Um, I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about what your understanding just of mindfulness is in a little bit more depth, even practically. I mean, I know to, I mean, I've, I've looked at, I've practiced some mindfulness techniques. So I'm just wondering even more precisely what you mean when you say it. I know that the general definition. And then secondly, if in your research, and looking to the saints, you know, you said you found this idea of the presence of God, but, but as far as like the, a, a more kind of technical practice of, of the sort of thing that, that you might find in a, in a yoga studio or a, a Tai Chi class or something like that, if you, if you found certain kind of like commonalities, like, oh, hey, the Desert Fathers were doing this, or you know, so that in your own idea of, of mindfulness, like, is it, do you, is it something novel that, that is your kind of blend of Christianity and, and yoga? Or, or is it something that you actually kind of found, like, oh, actually, this is in the Christian tradition. It's just not developed. Does that question make sense? Sure thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and I really appreciate the question. It's kind of just back to basics and, and the fundamentals of the definition. First of all, um, very simply paying attention to the present moment non-judgmentally, which is learning how to focus our mind and what we're thinking about without the, 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 what would be the mindless ruminations or mindless following of thoughts. And we don't realize how much we're actually judging our thoughts which lead us into these ruminations. And so this is broken down. I mean, there's essentially no difference between, uh, you, you mentioned a number of things there. So I would say, you know, it's not yoga, it's not Tai Chi, it's not, but there is, there is a, a secular eight week mindfulness based stress reduction protocol. And I use essentially the same thing, which is breaking down uh, cognitive theory looking at the ways that we think about things, and it gets into the, to the interaction with our, our sympathetic nervous response. So in other words, we judge there to be a problem that needs to be solved, and it activates our, our, our anxiety system, which is saying there's a threat, we need to solve it, we need to get rid of it, fight or flight. And, and then we wanna resolve that problem that we judged there to be. 
And that's a lot of that's happening unconsciously without our conscious awareness of it. So the practice of mindfulness itself is becoming aware of what's already happening cognitively. And so this, I, I, I wed this very deeply with John Paul II's personalism and his understanding of the human person. And so that what we want to do is create greater freedom through self-determination. That's philosophically speaking. The more that we're aware of what's happening in our minds as it's happening, the greater freedom we have over making choices if we're going to continue utilizing that, that thought process or not. So that's the value, and the implicit value, and the, and the sort of basic value. Regardless of what we do with it, there's value in self-awareness. Besides that, um, in terms of tracking how this matches up with other uh, traditions from the church, I would say two parts. Number one, I think we're in a time now that this has never been as necessary before. So even going back 100 years ago to, you know, well, 150 years ago to like a more agrarian society, we lived in the present moment naturally much more than we do today. So if you read a book like De Crusade or The, pra or the, or the Practice of the Present Moment, um, or tr you know, things would be naturally integrated much easier. You're spending all day in the dirt digging you know, trenches or, or you know, taking care of cattle or you know, whatever you're doing. Like, being in that moment is pretty normal. You know, and then you're adding God into it. So the physiological process has already sort of been set up for it. Whereas today, I think we need to do a lot of work to get out of the, the sort of ruminations that we're, we're developing for ourselves through distraction. However, I will say that, yes, the Desert Fathers and uh, a lot of the writings from the East especially, and I, uh, off the top of my head, I can't, there's one in particular I'm thinking of, but um, it's escaping my mind right now. And um, I just, we, we have such a, um, we lose out a lot on not having a lot of the Church of the East more as a part of our catechesis. But um, they, the specific elements that are found in mindfulness-based stress reduction of what to do with thoughts can be found in some of these other things. So in the, in the Desert Fathers talk about Achadia, what to do with the noonday devil, and then especially when it comes to certain kinds of temptations, like when these thoughts enter in, they make it very clear not to focus on them as problems that you're solving. You need to get them out. You know, there's a, there's a certain, uh, I think is it even, is it St. John Vianney that, that's, you know, even the example of him waking up and finding the devil in his room in the middle of the night, and, and then he just says, oh, it's just you, and he turns back and goes to sleep. You know, this like sort of ability to turn away from a, a problem or a thought without giving it more credit than it's due and, and perseverating on it and focusing on it, that actually creates bigger problems. So that's a main part of mindfulness that I do see mirrored in, in other dimensions. And that has to do with just sort of being uh, astute in, in making observations of, of our cognitive functioning that I think has always been true about being human, whether, whether or not the, the sort of... Um, environment is, is making us worse than, than ever before. So hopefully that answers some of your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And I think maybe we'll make this our, our last question and then wrap up. Hi, Dr. Botaro. Um, I'm Stephanie. I work in the Office of Campus Ministry, and a number of my colleagues are here. Um, so I wanted to speak from that experience. I, you know, being here in northern New Jersey, I feel like I deal with a lot of students who have this low grade level of like constant anxiety related to a lot of cultural factors and pressure to perform and just kind of the system that we've built for ourselves here. Um, and so I notice that oftentimes they'll have a compelling experience of God on a retreat or um, in a class where they're reading scripture, um, but they struggle to like grow past that space. So I'm wondering if you would say that mindfulness can be a really helpful building block for people like me to help students grow in just getting to know themselves better and getting to know God better. 
Um, so that's kind of my first question. And then my second question was if, if you would, wouldn't mind commenting more bluntly on like your assessment of overuse of technology and like technological addiction amongst young people today, because what I'm observing in that realm is very frightening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I think mindfulness, like I said, it's a great gateway drug to go to the deeper things. So I think using it for people to tap into uh, you know, experiences that are beyond, they're sort of like outside what they expected. And, and again, you guide them if they have good coaching and good sort of like accompaniment. You know, that's, that's the difference. I think when you just sort of throw exercises at people or a book, that's like you're missing it. If you're in the relationship and the relationship is actually, it's actually the most important thing. And then, you know, the mindfulness is an exercise that you're sharing and it's a part of, you know, you're definitely moving things in the right direction in terms of an experience of what can be happening in my own brain that I didn't expect. I didn't know. I have people constantly tell me, I didn't realize I could actually have a day without stressing out about something or worrying about something. And then they say, I, I can't believe I just went a half day. A whole, I, I got to lunch without worrying about this thing. I never thought that was possible. Like, that's profound. And if, if you're walking with somebody, helping them have that experience, the importance of who you are in their life is just, and you can see also uh, to the negative side of it, that's also why this is really dangerous. Like, the influences are, we're, we're vulnerable to these influences. Again, that's how we're made by God. To be vulnerable to relationship, to receive from others. And so, yeah, we can walk with people, we can share these things with people, and just like prayer, obviously, well, I won't even say just like prayer. Prayer is hierarchically more important. But experientially, we've had these experiences too. You take somebody to adoration. And it's like, I would have thought that was boring. You know, and the next thing you know, it's like, wow, that was really beautiful. Like, I don't even know why. Like, what was going on with the thing on the, the little white circle? Like, what was it? It's like, I'll tell you about that later, you know. But it's like the experience of encounter and accompaniment is so deep and important. So that's where I would look at it to start, but recognize the importance of the relationship part of it. Um, and then uh, in terms of technology, you know, here's the thing about technology. We have to be really careful about this. And the church is very clear about this. Technology in itself is an expression of the creativity of our humanity, and, and which is a quality of God that we are an image of. So we cannot demonize technology. And, and, and the demons, you know, the enemy wants us to demonize technology. Like, that would be a distortion of God. But with, you know, all, all great power comes great responsibility. And, and the ways that the technology is being used now, obviously, is horrendous in all sorts of different ways. So, number one, addictive, you know, the addictive patterns that are tapped into, the algorithms in these apps and this technology are, are being intentionally positioned to create addictive patterns in our brains and they're in real time with artificial intelligence modifying themselves based on usage so the more addictive behavior it's eliciting from people the more it's the apps are changing at like any given and facebook's old news at this point people kids don't even use facebook but Facebook is, there's a, at any given time, there's like 15 versions of Facebook that are actually live. And they're constantly testing colors and font and sizes and positions of different pieces. And based on real-time data that's accumulating over, you know, tens of millions of moments, each moment, they're making changes. So it's, that's the artificial intelligence tapping into our addictive process of our brains. It's very dangerous. So we have to be on the forefront of constantly making sure we're providing opportunities for, for disrupting patterns and dis disrupting behaviors. But I also really believe that there's an opportunity to use that technology. And so we also need to be building apps that are like we have the mindfulness now. We, Catholic mindfulness is through an app that we've developed called the integrated app. And we do things a little differently and it's not built on all these algorithms, but it's also realizing like everybody's got their phone out all day. So like 
if I want you to see this prayer or this, we just did a novena to St. Joseph and it's also right next to the virtual retreat of Catholic mindfulness exercises. So it's like, you know, it could channel this to people through the technology. So I always want to make sure I give the both and answer, but it is, you know, I always tell people in, in the longer conferences that I do or the, the, t the classes, I say, take out your phone and then turn it around and look at the back of your phone. And this is a mindfulness exercise. So I say, study the back of your phone and just look at the way the light plays off of the back of your phone. And then feel the texture and rub your finger around it and feel the smoothness and then the roughness. And then, and like for 45 seconds, just have somebody actually spend time with the object of their phone and then realize I've never in my life spent this time this much time with my phone because I'm always looking at the screen which is showing me images that's getting my brain to focus on things that are not this present moment in this time and space but whatever my imagination is creating based on the images that are coming off of this screen so you can use the phone for mindfulness whether it's the app or the phone itself but just to like break people into that awareness like Wow, I'm, I'm on this thing all day. Like my phone, my hand is on this thing every day, all day. And I actually never really felt it. What is my hand for? <laughs> now I can actually feel my phone and, and just create that little disruption. So keeping the balance, I think, is important. All right, so thank you everyone for, for your questions. We'll have to, to wrap things up at this point. Um, so just a few business things. Uh, if you did not uh, sign in on, on the way, okay, all right. Mary says, don't worry about it. Uh, but again, today, this, was, uh, this, this week is just getting started. Um, and I think a really wonderful start. So thank you to, to Dr. Greg. But you can see up, up here uh, on the screen a sampling of the events to come. Uh, if you go on the university calendar or the Center for Faculty Development website, uh, you can see the full list of events. Some are in person, some are virtual. So you find all the links to the virtual events up there as well. Uh, on this note of technology, we're going to have a, actually a talk uh, tomorrow at noon on Teams about using technology mindfully uh, with Dr. Ruth uh, Tesuria. So you might check that one out. Um, so again, uh, everyone, I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking Dr. Bataro for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.